Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. Ashley and I are in Seattle. Where it's rainy, rainy Seattle is exactly right. Rainy, also dark Seattle. <laughs> like this is, I have to reconsider all my lighting with the uh, time change. All right, get everybody get tuned in here and we'll get started. Right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started and we'll just let a few more people join us as things get underway. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle that's called Book Larder. We um, have just started to do a very small number of in-person events and, of course, cooking classes. But for the time being, we are continuing to host our, our author talks on Zoom as well. And that lets us do um, things like tonight where, you know, Ashley and I are in one place and Michelle is in another. Um, we had the pleasure of hosting Michelle for her first book in person, Dandelion and Quince. And so I am really delighted to welcome her back virtually to celebrate her wonderful new book, The Modern Larder. Um, like her first book, this, uh, this book sort of tackles some of the ingredients that we purchase and don't always know what to then do with if um, we cook sort of a traditional American sort of um, in, in a sort of a traditional American way in our kitchens. And so um, she and Ashley are going to talk about the book. They will, of course, leave time for your questions. So just use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have questions for Michelle. We are also, as always, recording tonight's event, and we will post that to our YouTube channel afterwards. Everybody who registered will get a link to that. So if you have to pop off early or you just wanna watch it again or share it, um, you will have access to that as well. You can support the talk by purchasing signed copy. We have book plate signed copies of the book from us. I will um, put a link to that in the chat after we get going so that to make that easy for you. And thank you to everyone who's done that so far. And um, I think I've covered everything. I was just about to say we're recording this, but we are, I already said that. So um, without any more delay then, let's welcome Ashley Rodriguez. Oh, that's what I didn't say. Michelle's in conversation with Ashley Rodriguez, <laughs> who is a lovely local author um, and a frequent host of these conversations. And so um, I know they're gonna have a really great chat. So please join me in welcoming Ashley Rodriguez and Michelle McKenzie. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Thanks so much for that, Lara and Michelle. Oh my gosh, what a pleasure it is to get to spend this evening chatting with you about your, like Lara said, your beautiful new book. I gotta say, I've already cleared a spot in my coveted like kitchen cookbook shelf because I just this is this is a classic. I Lara and I were talking about it right before. I was like, this book is amazing. I mean, even just flipping through it. I was getting so inspired, but the more I dig into it, the more like just little nuggets of ideas. And I, yeah, it's everything that I love in a book in that it's incredibly inspiring using ingredients that are both familiar and some might be new to me, um, but recipes that I know that I can just simply prepare on a weeknight. And um, so congratulations, this is amazing. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. The little nuggets and like people comment on those. And I kind of feel like that's that like that really gets me because I we actually had to edit this book down because um, it's so full of those nuggets that you're talking about. I, I'm a teacher like I, I ran a um, programming at a cooking school in San Francisco. And whenever I start talking about one thing, it's so hard not to just like and then, you know, this here's this and here's this little piece of wisdom and here's this tip and here's this trick. And so um, this got edited many times because I'm not kidding. There were probably a hundred pages more um, that had to get paired oh. back. <laughs> back. And you most of it were the book there. They were like wrangle it in, Michelle. <laughs> but we kept wow. as many as we could. Um, and I think it was just which ones are very relevant to the thing we're talking about right now. But if anybody 
has read anything and they want more, please. Like, so I can use all that information that I had to cut. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Oh, that's really, that's exciting to hear. Cause I just, yeah, I can't imagine how much time and energy you put into this book, which we'll get, I want to get more to the specifics of that. But first I'd love to hear, you mentioned that you were a, a teacher an instructor. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and what led you to write this book. Yeah, I mean, like the big backstory, like I'll condense it, is um, I have a nutrition and biochemistry degree. And I really sort of, as I was studying, I got really interested in food and healing and I kind of wanted to learn more about cooking. And so I didn't think I was going to go into the field of cooking. I, I didn't think the culinary world was like the thing I was going to do. I thought I was going to honestly like do research, biochemistry research, <laughs> but I wanted to go to culinary school. So I went to a school in, in New York City um, that specialized in food and healing and things like that. And then I started working in restaurants. You have to do an externship and I couldn't leave. I just like did not want to leave. And I loved it so much. And um, I just never went back to the other path. I just like kept going, kept going. And at a certain point, I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing now. Um, and I started teaching really early on. I love teaching. Like that's the thing that I actually really love doing. Um, the writing is just another way to teach. Um, so I started teaching really young, like shortly out of, um, and I was teaching at, a, um, a, actually at a cancer institute in Atlanta where I was at the time. Um, and I was teaching um, cooking to, people um, who had health struggles and the family members of people who had health struggles. And I started teaching there. And then that was it that like clicked for me. And yeah, I did other stuff, you know, but um, all along that's been the thing I have sought out. So when I was in San Francisco, uh, there's a great cooking school on 18th street in the mission called 18 reasons. It's actually a nonprofit organization and we have public classes on 18th street. And then we have programs. I say we now, like, cause I'm <laughs> I did it for four years, so it's hard. Um, they they have programs then that go out into the community and they teach free cooking classes um, out in the community. So um, I did that and I ran the programming there for four years and taught weekly, sometimes three times a week, four times a week. And my first book came out of classes there. So I was teaching a series on unsung vegetables, things that people, I saw people overlooking at the farmer's market or they'd pick it up and they'd like ask a few questions about it and then they'd put it down and walk away. And I'd always be like, wait, wait, wait. Like, so, you know, <laughs> like chasing after people. Um, and so I started teaching a class. I, I would, I, I, I'm, yeah. Um, and, you know, I started teaching this class and then the book came from that. And there was a lot of other stuff in between, but that's pretty much um, how I started writing books. When I was writing the first book, I noticed that, there were all these pantry ingredients that I turned to. Um, and when I would teach a class, I was noticing that those are as unsung as the vegetables that I'm teaching about. Like I would be doing something with creme fraiche, even though if the creme fraiche wasn't the focus for me, so I'm gonna be like, wait, you know, forget about the celery act for a second. Tell me about mm -hmm. creme fraiche. And I was like, oh, like this, you know, people would ask me sometimes too, like I have this jar of capers and I always use them on fish, always in the same way, either on, you know, a bagel with salmon or I saute fish and butter and I use my capers. I know I don't know anything else to do with capers. What else to do with capers? And so I was like, okay, it just started, kind of started clicking and I started banking recipes and writing notes. And so this book is actually the modern larder I've been working on for over six years because it started wow. when I was writing my first book. I mean, I wasn't working on it intensely for six years. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, I, as I had thoughts and, and, you know, as I taught about creme fraiche or said something in class about creme fraiche, I was like, write it down, you know? And so, um, when you read it, like that's, you're getting all of that. I mean, just, and, and in the midst of all that, I had a baby and I talk about this in the <laughs> book and I'm so grateful that that happened for this book because it really changed my perspective on things. And I really like, I took a red pen and I just went through and anything that just, I wouldn't do now that I have a child, I removed it from the book wow. because it gave me like, I was like, Oh, like this people, like I get it. You know, I mean, people tell you, but you don't really get it until you're in it. And um, yeah. I think it made the book better, you know, um, the sort of struggles with time and energy. 
Mm -hmm. um, so the book sort of evolved even more and it really, really became about mining the modern larder to make really special food um, without spending extra time in the kitchen. Not to say that every book, in, that every recipe in the book, you're not gonna spend any time in the kitchen. I will never say that. And I talk about that in the intro too. Like I believe that cooking takes time. Um, but hopefully you can find the pleasure in it. Um, and improvisation and thinking of ingredients as art is one way to find pleasure. Um, and I also know you just gotta have food on the table. And like you said, there's a, I tried to include a wide range. Like I drew like a Venn diagram and I was like, you know, I want there to be things that are really, really easy that, you know, and you know, I even, I even give, in recipes, I tried to give as many like parrot back even more comments and like in the intro to the chicken, for example, I'm giving you all these like fancy rubs, dry rubs, wet rubs. But at the beginning, it felt really important to me to say, look, if you don't have time to do any of the rubs that follow, here's the, here's the way to cook a chicken well, perfectly. And you don't need any of this stuff that comes after. Um, so anyways, like, which is so freeing. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is so freeing. And I, and I, yeah, I love how you talk about it in the, in the introduction that, you know, yeah, let's cooking. It's, it's not something, obviously I love to cook as well. And so it's not something that we necessarily, the purpose isn't just to like rush through it, but this is thoughtful food that if you put a little bit of time and energy into prepping some of the things in advance, particularly some of the delicious things that you mentioned in the back of the book, then it really is quite simple and comes together very, very quickly. But yeah, then there are those days where you just want to linger in the kitchen, like you talk about, and just put on music yeah. and spend the time chopping. Um, I love how you wrote about that. I, I also love, I think this is incredible that you could just um, whittle the, the heart of the book down to one thesis statement as you talk about it, but one ingredient can change the nature of a dish, elevating it from flat to transcendent. I think that's, that's beautiful and, and so true. And I think that's how you, how you write about that, how you boil the recipes down to its essence, and then also give so many like different paths to take, to come to a similar, similar end point you know and different ingredients that you can use in substitutions and things like that is really inspiring and also I find as you know someone who's reading the book there's there's a lot of freedom in that which is yeah I was thinking freeing as you were saying that like that yeah you know we want people to feel more free in the kitchen after teaching for so many years all age groups I've I've taught five-year-olds to like 70 I mean actually my eldest teacher was like 87 um I've taught oh, wow. I write about him in my first book, a special place in my heart for him. But, you know, what I saw like is that people get, not everybody, right? But a lot of people tend, especially if they're looking at a recipe, they tend to get like locked in and it really doesn't need to be like that. You know, these ingredients that I'm talking about can really elevate a dish. You know, if you roast um, broccoli or Brussels sprouts and you throw it, you like heat, if you like some chili heat and you throw a chili to herbal on the, the pan that's in, that's roasting in the oven, like it really does completely change the nature of the broccoli. Or I roasted, um, potatoes earlier today and I just, I didn't have a lot of time, but I threw a sprig of rosemary on the pan. I threw like whatever little piece of preserved lemon rind I managed to like get out of the jar as quickly as possible. And I threw that on the the pan, the sheet pan with the roasting potatoes. And it just sort of like the rosemary and the preserved lemon just infused the oil that was cooking the potatoes and made them taste better than they would have otherwise. Um, do you have to add the preserved lemon? No, and that's the freeing part. And did I have, you know, did I measure it? No, <laughs> like, um, and you know, while, while measuring has its place in cooking, like I really want people to be free and I want people to have fun. And then this is the other thing is like, I want people to be excited to go into the kitchen. And I think that when I, now that I have a three-year-old I really do see, <laughs> we had battles all day today, how there's something like, um, this will come, it'll come together. <laughs> like there's something really um, intrinsic to human nature that seeks novelty. And 
you know, I think when you have something novel in the kitchen or you like have cooked broccoli for the millionth time and you just want to do a little something different, like it makes you more excited to go and cook and it makes the people at your table more excited to eat. Yeah, absolutely. It is. I find that for sure. I mean, even flipping through and it's like, oh, I don't have that in my, in my pantry. I, I want to add that. And then suddenly you start to play around in your head with all these different combinations and it gets, it, that's what I find so yeah. inspiring. So yeah, whatever I've got three kids. So I, I know that I love to cook, but sometimes three. I don't <laughs> like to cook, especially yeah. when they have, you know, very particular palates. I right. say that nicely, but it's like, man, you guys are no fun. <laughs> of course, sometimes. Yeah, I know. But so whatever it takes to, to get me feeling excited to actually get me in there to, to go cook. Yeah. But, and I also find the key, you know, the novelty thing gets, if you have kids, not everyone listening to this has kids, like, but if you do, you know, it's amazing how something novel for them makes them want to eat whatever it is you serve. So like he went through a phase, like where he didn't like a bunch of things. He like loves radicchio and then he like refused radicchio. But then I gave him za'atar, like I mixed sumac and sesame seeds and thyme. And I put in a little ramekin and I said, here, try this za'atar. I use the word, I mean, he doesn't know what that is. And try it on your radicchio. And then he sprinkled on his radicchio. And because it was like, you know, him sprinkling, it was this new thing. Sprinkles, like, it's great. Nom, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> like, and he eats it up. So um, novelty also helps getting kids to eat vegetables. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, let's talk about the layout of the book a little bit. So you have uh, the first section includes all the beautiful ingredients that I now want to add to make sure that they're always in my pantry um, before you get to the recipes. So what, what inspired that and what, I mean, cause it takes up, you know, talking about each of the ingredients takes up a good bit of the real estate of the book, but then again, like digging into it further, I'm like, I mean, you should see my notes. I'm taking like, oh my gosh, I never thought about like just in the buckwheat too, of like, oh yeah, toasted and, and topping panna cotta with it and making a nice tea with it. All, all these things that I love buckwheat. I feel like I've used it a good bit. And then suddenly I see it in a completely different way, just in the way that you described it and how you use it in your kitchen. Yeah. I think it's, that was my way to fit 10 books into one book. <laughs> No, I mean, really, because so many of those tips in the beginning um, and part one came from recipes that got cut. And, you know, the editing part of a book is like painful for anyone who writes a book. Um, and I was just like, I have to find a way. And so what was initially going to be like, we struggled with the organization of the book. Like I really did sort of grapple with it. Like, you know, with Dandelion and Quince, the ingredient would be the introduction to a chapter. But that didn't work with this book because there was a lot of overlap. So like the buckwheat pancakes, for example, since you're talking about buckwheat, have yogurt in them and they get topped with levna. Um, and so which chapter do we put this in? You know, you could say the buckwheat's dominant. I don't know, we went through all of this. And when we started cutting recipes and I started sort of lengthening those chapter intros, I was like, no, like this needs to be its own part. And all of the people who edited this book had a really difficult time separating the recipes from the ingredients, but I just, I started to really see it. And my favorite part about part one too, is that it has all these ideas. Um, and it's kind of its own book, kind of. Um, I mean, that's why it's a part one. And then the really thing, it took a lot of extra work, but I was really excited about it. And this helped everyone feel comfortable with um, separating the description of the ingredient from the recipes that reference that ingredient is at the bottom of each, I have my book too, at the bottom of each page, um, like here's miso. Um, it's like the little mini table of content. I love so that. It's all the recipes that have miso with the page number. And that was the way, and it, you know, even where there's overlap, it's redundant so that, and the reason I really liked it and it just made, it became so clear because I don't expect everyone to have all these things. And I want someone to pick up this book and say, I have a jar of capers. I'm sick of using it just on salmon. What do I do with it? And they go to part one and they go to C and they go to capers and right there are all the recipes in the book that have capers. So it's kind of like an index, but with lots of information right above it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually like really happy. I was, it was so much 
extra work. I love this is yogurt and this is like all the recipes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that, that would be me too. Yeah. Yes. I love, I love it. Um, and you also talk about that, you know, you say, I love this because it, it would be me. That's like, oh my gosh, I need to go out tomorrow and buy all the things. But you say, you don't need to have all the things. In fact, if you had all these things, you probably wouldn't have room in your kitchen to cook. So yeah. um, it's like, okay, that's right. You know, maybe thinking about the ones that are most inspiring and the ones that I don't have in my kitchen currently, but I'm curious for you, what are the ones that you mm-hmm. are never without? Never some without. Of the ones that you're never looking without. at my kitchen from here. Yeah. Ghee. Um, ghee I use every day. Um, I use it equally as olive oil. Like, I mean, maybe they're not interchangeable, but I use it as much as I use olive oil. Um, I use chili de arbol, kombu. I cook a lot of beans and grains. So kombu, which is a seaweed I talk about, makes beans and grains. It's a carminative. It makes them more digestible. And it also um, has glutamate, which is MSG, the thing that's like some people fear, um, is really just a fake glutamate. Glutamate's a natural, naturally occurring thing that tastes delicious. So it's umami. So kombu, which is a seaweed, um, I cook with every pot of rice, grains, or any bean. And it adds a lot of flavor because of that natural glutamate. And it also makes things more digestible. So I we use that daily. Um, sumac. Um, actually, all this, I mentioned chili darable, all the chilies. Um, mm-hmm. And burlap and barrel, I'm not paid by them. I've never even talked to anyone who works there, <laughs> but they have a great selection of chilies. Um, and they're a great company. Um, and so I, I have a new chili from them called the Silk Chili. I'm always trying new chilies. I love, I don't like black pepper. This book. I just cleaned out my spicer no- and I, I, I had Silk Chili. So I'm excited that you mentioned oh, it. Because I was like, chili. oh, I yeah. don't think I used it. From burlap and yeah. So, so there's no black pepper in the book. Um, and so I rely on chili for, um, okay. I used to love black pepper. And then when I became pregnant, I developed an aversion to it. Literally like, actually would make me sick. And I never, oh. and it was at the time I was writing this book. I was like, well, this is kind of perfect because now I know how to make my food interesting without that. Um, and anchovies, never without anchovies. Um, grains, like all the wheat, I talk about heritage wheat berries. Um, I'm never without those, um, many types of farro, um, buckwheat's pretty common. We call it, my son calls them brown pancakes. Um, and he really likes the buckwheat pancakes. And then the other one is chickpea flour. I order, um, like 10 pound or even sometimes more p- pound bags of chickpea flour from Edison Granary, which is a great company as well. Um, because we eat the chickpea flour pancakes, the savory chickpea flour pancakes, we eat them every day. Every day. Um, every day. And we have for two years. Um, and, you know, some people are used to eating cereal. I've never been able to do that uh, for breakfast. Um, and I, you know, for a long time, I was like rice and greens, which I have my big, my big batch breakfast greens in here. And then when my son was born, um, I wasn't giving him rice. Like when he was starting to eat solid foods, I was avoiding rice. And so I developed this recipe. Um, and we've eaten it for breakfast every day since. Wow. Um, so chicken butter. Um, those would be like the first one. Those are like the ones that definitely every day. Um, and, you know, the other ones come and go in rotation based on just like, I think there's always miso in my fridge. Yogurt comes and goes. Like sometimes, you know, I'm without it and it's fine. Um, even though there's a lot of it in the book. Tahini I always have which I think most people these days pretty much are hooked on tahini. Mm-hmm. Um, I, made, I made like a kind of a weird, but good pasta sauce with it. I'm always experimenting. My son loves it. He'll just like eat it. Like it's not even salted, but he'll just eat it plain. Um, so I made like a pasta sauce with that the other day. It was like yeah. a cold like, salad with it, but it was like creamy. And he like, we put um, pine nuts on top and he just like ate it all up. Um, and the, the, yeah. the tahini hot chocolate, I'm like, oh, that is genius that sounds so yeah good. so I can't I'm just somebody I can eat ghee and I can eat yogurt I can't eat a lot of other dairy so I'm always mm-hmm. kefir I can do but I you know it has to be pretty much like cultured is like really what it has to be for me to be able to digest it well um so the tahini hot chocolate is like a way to have a creamy hot chocolate without 
milk you know because the cultured milk that's not so good <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> hot chocolate kefir, yeah no kefir that sounds chocolate. amazing yeah. it makes sense I mean it would make it nice and creamy and thick and rich yeah yeah um I'm also curious of of when you discover a new a new ingredient that finds its place in your larder what's what's that process like to you and and where do you go to discover new things or is that a something that you do to kind of stir up that creative and en- energy and like you were mm-hmm. talking about too that using that to get you excited to get into the kitchen how do you find those the honest answer to that is it's been a long time um I've relied on these things because I'm familiar with them and I live in the country now I don't really do a lot of like I go to a farmer's market um the stores around here actually do have these things but I haven't seen anything new lately that's really like I'm so you know people who are asking questions if you have something new that I should check out let me know but I'm not seeking you know I'm just at this phase in my life where like we just moved and you know the seeking energy I just don't have um and so I've honestly sort of like dug my heels in a bit when it comes to my repertoire I'm just like you know, I mean, some days I'm like calling it in. I burnt myself twice a day. Just like, that's all tired. Oh, no. <laughs> but I get it. I think that that's good to know that that is what people, what cooking is like for people um, who aren't trained and who have really busy lives. And um, I'm not really creative anymore. But when I was going through it, I would say it's similar to finding a new vegetable or a new fruit. Um I just like get it, I taste it, I see what it reminds me of. Like dried lime would be a good example. I hadn't had, I had had dried lime when I was a kid, but I never knew what it was because I had a friend whose grandmother cooked with it. Um, But when I, so when I was older and I saw it again, I was like, oh, and so I knew all these traditional ways of using it. But then I was just, okay, well, what is, like I just sort of like go into like at its essence, what is this? At its essence, it's citrus. And a little with a little bit of funk, right? Like that's it. Well, that just opens the door wide open. I can use mm. that. I can just a citrus with a little bit of funk. Like I can just think of a hundred things to do with that, two hundred things to do with that, because citrus goes with everything, right? Um, but it has a color, so that limits it a little bit. Whereas lemon juice doesn't really add color. So I don't know. I just kind of go with like I throw the door wide open, and then I like okay, here's the limitation. Here's the limitation. It's not so conscious like this but that is what happens I think um yeah and you know tahini is creamy right it, at its essence it's just like a creamy thing especially once you like mix it and it's nutty so it's creamy and it's nutty and if you add lemon juice or yogurt to it then it really becomes perfectly balanced and like kind of bright um and so that just like I was like okay pasta sauce right like that was just a random experiment the other day because it's creamy and it's bright once I add lemon juice. And so I think that will make it, I don't have any mayonnaise. I don't really want to make any kind of sauce. I don't have any cream, but I just need to make a quick sauce, you know, and just drip a little tahini, he'll eat it. Like, that's good. It was delicious, right? (laughs) I mixed mine. I did my batch. He doesn't like chili, but I took, I took the pasta salad and I tore up some pea shoots that I had and added some Aleppo chili and the pine nuts and olive oil. Um, oh, that sounds amazing. But yeah, I just think about like the essence and then like the limitations. Um, but it's not so conscious. And I think people should just, you know, experimentation though, I get where people don't do it because it takes time. And when you Mm -hmm. fail, like it feels like wasted time. Um, yeah. And and I think those seasons of like needing that, that excitement and that, you know, and using some of that creative energy and then there's seasons yeah. where you don't have the space for that. That's why we I have cookbooks. Right. I love cookbooks. Exactly. You know? Well, you just did for me what, I mean, I am, I am so inspired. I'm so excited to, you know, dig out some things that I've been hiding in the nooks and crannies of my fridge, my pantry, and then, and adding some new things. Wait, what do you my, have? What is hiding in your nooks and crannies? <laughs> well, I mean, I was just cleaning out, you know, I was cleaning out my fridge and my pantry for, um, and saw it's like, oh yeah, I, I do have a jar of anchovies that I haven't like busted into in a while that like, yeah. oh, this, this does, it adds so much, you know, I tend to go more towards like Parmesan. I'd put Parmesan in everything for that, like deep umami flavor, yeah. but I love the brininess of anchovy and just in 
um, dressings and, and um, sauces and things like that, like in a simple tomato sauce, adding an anchovy just for yeah. that, like you talk about too, you're like, it doesn't taste fishy. You're just like, what is that? What is that flavor? Yeah. Um, it goes well with Parmesan, and, so you can. Yeah, perfect. I also learned something um, that I would always get my capers in brine because that's what I can most often find, but you were saying to get them um, salt packed for many if different reasons. Yeah. yeah, if you can. If you can, then just like rinse the ones that are brined um, really well and dry them really well, you know? Maybe like toss them with a little olive oil and salt. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, you know, you know I, I struggled with that too. Like, I didn't wanna tell people like, here's the best thing you can get. And then people have to go seek, 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 seek to try to find the best version of something, you know? So it's like, I did the same with anchovies. Like these are the different kinds. If you can get this, this is the most versatile. If you can't, you can use the other thing. And it's the same with capers. Like if that's what your store sells, like mm -hmm. don't avoid capers because, um, but if you can get salt pack, I mean, that's the thing with, you know, you have the internet these days. And I almost think exactly. that after what we've been through the past year, people do more online shopping probably than they did previously. Um, and I, people probably have like the, you know, there's so many stores now. I don't even know. It's like a whole world of like online food shopping that I don't even, but I'm sure a lot of them have salt pack capers. Yeah. I can think of a few stores that I know that have it. Um, but yeah, the brand ones are good too. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did. Okay. I know there's several questions and so I don't want to hog all your time, but there was just a few things that like really blew my mind. And one of them, I have to talk about your chocolate chip cookies. I mean, you say like, does the world need another chocolate chip cookie recipe? Yes, yes, it no. does because yours has <laughs> vinegar in it, though. Yeah. That was very yeah. surprising, and I'm really curious what that does. Is it for you know, like, does it add a flavor, or is it more for the chemistry of the cookie, or what? It both, both. Like both. vinegar is been used in cakes in the form of mayonnaise sometimes. Um, like mayonnaise is just like oil, egg, and an acid, right? Um, and people who use mayonnaise and cakes, it adds flavor, it adds moisture. Um, but, you know, an acid component in anything really, really affects the flavor, even if it's just a little bit. Um, so using, I mean, I use vinegar more often in baking than I use vanilla extract. Um, I just think it's more important. Um, mm. And so it's kind of like the anchovy, like you were saying, you're not gonna think vinegar. Um, but you should never really think vinegar unless it's a pickle of some sort. Um, and you know, or, or a sauce for oysters. I was like, is there another case? Um, but <laughs> no, um, but for baking, you wouldn't think that those chickpea flour pancakes I'm talking about one time I made them without any acid in them and they were just really dull. They're just so mm -hmm. dull. You eat them and you don't think like this has yogurt, lemon juice, or vinegar in it when it has it, but they taste good. And without it, they're just like a little bit more boring. And I think the same thing is true for um, cakes and cookies as well. Um, yeah, I think almost every dessert probably has an acid component, most of them anyways, something. Um, and I just think it's, I don't eat a lot of dessert. I just, I like savory things. I fill up on savory things because I just love salty, crunchy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but when I do, like, I want it to be like really well balanced. I don't like things that are too sweet. I don't like things that are like, I guess, monotonous, you know, or like cloying in any way. And the vinegar just, you know, the same thing with like savory cooking. Um, I mean, everyone's read Simeon's wonderful book, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. And like the like acid component, not everyone's read that. I should say that, but it's a fabulous book if you haven't read it. Um, but she talks about the acid um, component and it is, it's just like so, so important in all cooking. Um, mm -hmm. I add it to eggs, like I make a chili vinegar that's in the book unless it got cut. Like I think it's good. I'm, I'm, and when I fry an egg, so a chili vinegar is just chili to arbol that's been left to sit in vinegar um, until it's as spicy as you want it to be. And I like drizzle that on my egg, like, cause the mm -hmm. egg is rich, you know, an egg is really rich An egg with yogurt's really good. I think I talked about this somewhere too. in one of the recipes, I think in the whey poached eggs, um, but a little bit of vinegar drizzled on eggs is like really phenomenally good. 
Um, yeah. We all like acid, um, even if we don't know it. Um, and I mean, that's basic. That's like a deconstructed hot sauce, basically, like vinegar yeah, and that's spice. That's a very easy one. A very homemade, like yeah. an easy homemade hot sauce. Just put a dry chili and some vinegar and let it sit. Um, but and the other thing, you know, the cookies, you know, one thing I did do for texture for those is the extra egg yolk, like, which makes it really like chewy cookie. So I wanted like both crispy and chewy at the same time. Mm. Although my favorite cookies are the tahini, the tahini cookies yeah. in the book. Those are um, amazing as well. And they happen to be dairy free. The tahini like replaces the need for butter um, because it's rich. Like that's what I mean about like its essence. Um, and they happen to be gluten free too. I developed those for my mom who can't have gluten or dairy. And I developed those for her. And I was like, well, these happen to be my favorite cookie too. Oh, did I lose you? A second. Oh, there you are. Oh. Okay, good. I was like, is it just me? No. <laughs> Sorry. I, lo I lost okay. that last bit that you said, but I'm with you on those tahini cookies. <laughs> um, okay, so I see there's a good bit of questions and I don't want, I wanna make sure that everyone has an opportunity to ask because we've, I'm sure they have many questions for you. So if all of you out there, if you have any questions, just put them in the Q&A and we'll ask some of those, okay. Um, let's see. Someone is asking, wanting to get a feel for the book, what the, she would love to know what you are trying to accomplish, how the book is organized, which we touched on briefly. Mm -hmm. And if the recipes are included, what criteria were used as gatekeepers for inclusion? Ooh, that is a great question. Yeah. Yeah. So gatekeepers for inclusion, for me, the number one test of like integrity is do I want to cook this every like all the time like is this something I want to cook you know is this to show off like it's gone right those make their way into the first round like is this to just show my culinary prowess like gone um so is this something I want to cook do I you know like for instance there's the lamb and phyllo pie I don't want to cook that every week like that's a lot of work mm -hmm. um, the lamb and lamb's quarter pie but do I want to make it every spring yes do I want to make it maybe twice in the spring yes do I want to make every cookie that's in this book all the time no do I want to make them for Christmas gifts every year would these be the three cookies that I would choose above all other cookies yes like so that's the integrity it's like really honestly you know I chose the ingredients based on what I thought were accessible to the general public but the recipes have to for me, I don't know how other people edit recipes from their books. For me, the only way that the book had integrity was like, do I want to cook them? And at the end of the mm. day, like if 75% of those, 30% of those resonate with you or somebody else, like I, I, I wrote what I was excited about and what I believe is good. Um, yeah. And the sort of, and attainable, right? Like um, there are so many books out there that have good food, but it's not attainable. Um, so that's right. sort of, you know, what that's, that's, that was the biggest gatekeeper. Well, the, the other amazing thing, and I imagine now after our, just our conversation of hearing how much extra material you also have is you have these incredible charts that you, know, you guys <laughs> probably can't see it, but it's like, here's, an incredible recipe and then here's like five to ten other ideas for what you can do with that as well and there's another one in here that's like a new way to fruit salad and you know there's that pomelo salad with the crispy shallots that I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh that sounds I right. again never would have thought but that sounds incredible and then if you like that kind of idea then here's all these other different ideas for you know when different fruits are in season and that kind of stuff so it's it's the recipes themselves are incredible sounding and very approachable um but then there's all these other resources that even fill you with more ideas so i think that's very very exciting all right let's see um and then tina was wondering if you have a favorite recipe which I know is probably a very hard question to answer. Yeah. It depends on the day. I mean, I so the one we cook the most is the chickpea flour pancake, without a doubt. Truly, we've eaten those every day. And I make a huge batch of those. 
um, and freeze them. So actually I made them today. That's when I burned myself just because I was too tired to be cooking, but, um, and moving really quickly, but, um, I make a huge, huge batch of those and I cool them in the refrigerator and I freeze the ones we're not going to use that week. Um, mm. I, I talked about this in, in the recipe. Um, so I'm not cooking those every week cause that I, you know, I, we're busy and it's, it's hard having a three-year-old. Um, but you know, I, I save time on a weekend, some time to do a really big batch. And then I freeze some for the, for like three weeks at a time, basically. I make three weeks worth of those pancakes and we all eat them every day. Um, oh my gosh, I have to actually like look, favorite recipe. No, that, I mean, it's really hard. I mean, I talk about like the the ribs, the pork ribs, I think I mentioned, I don't know if this got cut. <laughs> it's, it's so funny because I did, you know, it's been a long time since I, um, yeah, I crave these ribs. They really, like I do say it, like I grew up mm. in the South eating ribs. And I think it's just like in me to just crave things on the bone. And these are the best ribs I've ever had. I'm like, oh. and my dad, my dad, who is a very, hmm, like, I don't want to use the word picky. He has preferences and he's very specific. That's a nice way of saying it. He will yeah. never fluff you up. So until these ribs, my dad would always just like, he'd eat my food. He'd be like, mm, this is pretty good, Michelle. I'm pretty good. I you was know? just going to say, I was like, I can't find them, but there's a picture. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, page 283. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, page 283. Um, when he ate these ribs, I would never forget it. Cause it's like the first time he was super enthusiastic about my food and we were sitting in the backyard eating these and he's like, these are so good. Um, oh, and that's how I feel. Doesn't that feel amazing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it really does. <laughs> okay. So that's what the, the Ngoshi plum vinegar. Oh, and kombu stock. And then these things, these, we call these like strong bars, fruity bars. Let's see, how can I turn this towards my camera a little better? Um, when my, I mean, I went through a phase where I ate those every day. Um, they're sort of addictive. Um, oh, wow. I think and then I, anything, I anything with cabbage or beans. So no, I don't have a favorite recipe, but we eat cabbage and beans every single week in my house. So I have a whole section on cabbage cabbage for many occasions um, because I am not kidding. We eat cabbage <laughs> like every week and bean. So like there's a slow cooked bean with a slow cooked white bean with tomato and curry leaf. Mm. I riff on that. Sometimes I don't have curry leaf, which you can, by the way, if you ever find curry leaf, just buy a whole lot of it and freeze it because it freezes so well. Um, but if I don't have curry leaf, sometimes I'll add dry lime or um, even just a, if I don't have dried lime, just like a pinch of turmeric, like there's ways to even different ways. And then sometimes we add kale to that and stew the kale with the white beans. Sometimes we add farro, sometimes we add farro and kale. Um, so I make like variations on that all the time as well. Yeah, that all sounds so good. Um, okay, could you explain when you use olive oil as opposed to when you choose to use ghee? That's a hard question. Um, ghee has a high smoking point. So whereas butter and olive oil are definitely not interchangeable, ghee is almost interchangeable. I mean, it's solid. So in that sense, it's, it's not the same as olive oil, but you can pan fry a fish and ghee um, unless you leave your burner on high and walk away, um, you're not gonna burn the ghee. Um, so it can be used for everything except for deep frying. Um, and, you know, I use it based on just like which flavor I want. I mean, obviously you can't drizzle ghee unless it's warm, but I do sometimes warm it and drizzle it as a dressing. And I do that in this mm -hmm. book. Um, and um, yeah, you can soften it and use it in baking. I mean, <laughs> it's like pretty versatile. So it just, it's about flavor. You know, there's some things where olive oil, like I don't like olive oil in my scrambled eggs. You know, um, the flavor of olive oil I adore, but there are some occasions where the flavor of butter um, just seems more welcome to me. So I know that's not like such a straight, like detailed answer, but that's like the truth. It's like more instinctual than it is like, um, it's not rigid. Um, and sometimes they use both in the same dish. There you go. Yeah. Um. 
All right, got more questions. These are wonderful questions. Thank you to everyone who has been asking them. Um, does the book contain meat and fish recipes as well as vegetarian? As we saw with the ribs, yeah, there's some meat in there. But there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot some meat of in there. Um, yeah, you know, I there's more, I would say more vegetarian than meat. Um, the meat is like kind of a smallish section. Um, so I, I do eat meat, but I love, like really love vegetables and find them to be really interesting. Um, but um, so there's, there are, there's a squid recipe, there's a few fish recipes um, and there's maybe like, there's a whole chart on meatballs, the modern meatball, all these different ways to make, meat, make meatballs interesting. Um, there's a steak recipe, a ribs recipe, a lamb recipe, two lamb recipes, and a few chicken recipes, um, and a rabbit recipe. And I think that's all the meat. And it's a big book, like it's almost 400 pages. So if you think about that, like there's a lot of vegetables um, and a lot of, I'm actually teaching a class um, in January at Milk Street um, on vegetarian mains um, because I love them and there's so many in this book. Yeah. Actually, I had a, a, a question recently from um, someone on Instagram who was talking about vegetarian mains for Thanksgiving. And I'm curious, well, one, are you cooking mm -hmm. for Thanksgiving? Mm -hmm. um, and, and do you do the, the turkey thing or do you have something that's a vegetarian main that's not, not really kind of an afterthought, but something that's thoughtful? Yeah, I mean, I'm unusual. First of all, my kitchen's under construction. Um, oh. We... We, it, yeah, we were looking for a house for a long time. We bought a house and um, the house is amazing and I'm so grateful for it. The kitchen um, had some really old appliances and the countertop was warping. We had planned on not doing much, but we had to sort of gut the kitchen, which in, in the end, I'm really glad we did. There lots of surprises. Um, so I don't really have a really productive kitchen and we're squatting in a rental right now um, with all of our stuff in storage. So we are not hosting for Thanksgiving um, and I'm not cooking anything special. And I'm kind of unusual in that for all holidays, for me, the pr I have no pressure to do anything. I, I just, I love celebration. I love ritual. I love tradition, but does it need to look like a turkey with stuffing? And I love all that stuff, but it doesn't need to look like that for me. I grew up eating chicken and dumplings for holidays because that's what my family did. Um, so I have a soft spot for those. I love turkey. I love ham. There's a great farm here who has like really amazing ham. So probably at Christmas when we have our kitchen, if we have our kitchen, um, I'll do something then. Um, as far as a thoughtful um, I'm thinking, like if I had a vegetarian coming to Thanksgiving, um, I would do a grain salad with beans. Like I would do, I mean, I'm just thinking of it now, but I would do like farro or some sort of wheat berry or einkorn or, or something or white sonora berries. Um, something hearty, like a hearty grain, could be barley, could be all sorts of things, um, with like roasted pumpkin, um, like a roasted kabocha or whatever, whatever, I say pumpkin winter squash that you like to cook. Um, and I would just put like some beans, either some chickpeas or, or white beans. I think like a really thoughtful, not like overly tossed, like be very careful with all the ingredients, grain salad. I would add maybe some greens, maybe some, um, a little bit of arugula, not to make it a salad, but just like, um, like almost like an herb, like use arugula like an herb and maybe in some nuts, some walnuts and walnut oil, which I is in the book. Um, mm. So farro, roasted winter squash, this roasted until it's a little crispy and a little caramelized, some walnuts. Um, if you have like beans, like some beans in there, I would make a like a really good dressing. It's amazing. That's what I mean. Like a thoughtful dish doesn't have to be fancy it needs to taste good right and so if you can get walnut oil or you can get banyol's vinegar to make a dressing for this salad this grain dish um it'll just totally change how the whole like banyol's and a good olive oil will make farro and pumpkin and arugula and walnuts taste extraordinary um so that's what i in salt please use salt <laughs> if you if you can um please like it really makes it makes something like that's a thoughtful thing like taste 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 like the mm. thought comes in like the ingredients in the making it doesn't come in like the, the like show like I don't know the aesthetic or like that it's that classic image of like 
you know, someone parading in the giant whole turkey that I think is, you know, right. The, the right. Just, yeah. Like, no, let's parade in that beautiful salad. I would, I would yeah. put that into the <laughs> dining room. Yes. That sounds right. incredible. Yeah. I do yeah. like turkey though too, but yeah, I mean, we, we're more likely to eat the grain salad. Um, or like we use meat a lot as like the small portion, the small part of the meal, almost like mm-hmm. the accent. Um, but, um, like a flavoring, yeah. almost a like you talk so about, effective. yeah, you talk a lot about, um, I never pronounce it right, but Induja, mm-hmm. that like salami yeah. paste too, like using, yeah. using that just kind of accent and adds so much flavor, but it's not the, the main portion of the meal. Right. Or like anchovies, like you mentioned. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think there's one more. It's not a question, but. What a lovely comment says, uh, Jennifer says, I love this concept in the conversation because it gives me permission for having such a full fridge and pantry. Oh my gosh. Yes. I am absolutely a collector and user of old and modern larder ingredients. So my shelves and my wish list are always overflow. I can't wait to get to the book and try new ideas with everything. Mm-hmm. That's exactly how I. Thank you, Jennifer. Ashley, we a book read. full of recipes. Oh, here we are. <laughs> Could you not hear me? Just for a second. I, I, yeah, you cut out just a little bit. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's fine. I was. Were you gushing, <laughs> Ashley? I was gushing. I, I was just keep on gushing hand gestures. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> that's when you know it. Ashley is excited when the hands start. Flowing. Um. No, I just, I, I, I don't know what you heard, but I was talking about how I just cleaned out my pantry and now I'm ready to like fill it with all these incredible ingredients, especially I was also, you, I'm glad that you mentioned the Daniel's vinegar, which I've had before, but it hasn't been a staple, but after reading, you sing its praises, I'm like, oh my gosh, I am ordering a bottle right now. It's so good. Yeah. Like the, the way that you describe and your writing is just absolutely gorgeous, but the way that you describe like that it's, you know, it's just so well balanced and it has that a little bit of sweetness and it's not too, that puckery flavor that can be a little harsh. So. Yeah, totally. Uh, M- Michelle, I'm remodeling my kitchen as well. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I did, uh, Ashley and I were discussing yesterday sort of the, uh, you know, the massive pantry purge and things that happen when you pack all that stuff up and whatnot. And um, I can't wait to use this book as a guide to restock because I'm going to bring in like so many interesting things and know what to do with them now, finally. (laughs) Oh, I think it's the perfect time of year for this book too, because I feel, you know, we're getting into, I don't know, especially here in the Northwest, right, Laura, like in the winter, it's like greens and greens and and vegetables and greens. Exactly. and and, And so like, adding some different, you know, different flavors and, and, and to, it'll make the greens exciting again. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Look at that so. cabbage chart for, to get you through the winter. I'm in the, I'm, I'm in the Northeast now. So, oh um, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. You get it. Big move. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, both of you. This was really great. Um, yeah, this was a treat. Thank you, oh, it was so much thank, fun. I'm so glad we got so. to do this. Thank you, Laura. We, your congratulations on the book. Um, you know, I think that we've both like oohed and odd over it and <laughs> enough, but it's also, besides being very beautiful, extraordinarily useful. And so, you know, just because I'm gushing about how pretty it is and things, it's a lot more than just pretty. It's a really wonderful, useful book. So thank you so much for spending six years on it. I mean, again, the integrity piece, I wrote it for myself. I, you know, I, it's like so nice to like write this and then it's your own inspiration to refer back to. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I do, I, I get from it all the time. Good. Excellent. And thank you everyone for tuning That's in um, and have a lovely Thanksgiving and everyone stay Happy safe and healthy. Happy cooking. Yeah. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You everyone. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye, Ashley. Bye, Laura. Bye. Bye.